Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and especially Philippe for this and now so far the opportunity to talk about some work in progress that I'm doing with my PhD supervisor, Benjamin Basso, and our collaborator, Alessandro Geogurdis. And I'm going to talk about quantum spectral curve today. So, I guess all of you know that the integrability is an extremely powerful so one plus one dimensional models. And we can solve a plethora of models with integrability tools, which range from quantum spin chance to statistical vertex models to quantum field theories like sigma models and even, even stuff on the classical side like partial differential equations. The study of these integrable structures led us to dis discover many mathematical structures that are pretty nice. For example, the BD ansatz and the associated Young-Baxter equation that led to the discovery of quantum groups. Side. And also, if you go to the classical side, we have, for example, this uh, finite gap solution that leads to some algebraic curve description of solutions in terms of uh, Riemann surfaces. However, I'm a guy from high energy physics, and I'm mainly interested in four dimensional quantum field theories that are extremely important models. However, they are mainly it's difficult, and most information that we have about these models come only from perturbation theory. So the question that I want to answer is, can we get exact results about for DQFTs using integrability methods? And the answer is yes. And to show some nice examples, today we'll concentrate on planar n equals four super young mu's theory, which was presented by Shota Komatsu in a really pedagogical way last week. And my main goal here is to show how from emerging from this four dimensional QFT, we can get really nice new integrable structures such as quantum spectral curve that solves the problem of computing exactly and non perturbatively the spectrum of anomalous dimensions of the theory and also the more exact uh, more exotic construction of the hexagon form factors that allow us to compute uh, structure constants for that i start really gently so i revisit the heisenberg spin chain a model that all of you know and we, I will try to solve it in a way that is suitably ad adapted for a generalization to n equals four super young mu's. Then I'll introduce what we'd like to compute in n equals four super young mu's. And using the same philosophy as for the Heisenberg spin chain, I will try to construct the quantum spectral curve for anomalous dimensions. And to end, I'll show a really recent application where we managed to use quantum spectral curve to compute structure constants using the hexagon. Formalism. So we start with the pretty well known Heisenberg XXX spin chain, which is a simply one dimensional model where we have a periodic <coughs> chain with L sites, and in each site we have a spin two, a spin one half that can interact with its nearest neighbor via this coupling constant G square through an interact for an exchange interaction. This model has uh, manifest SU2 symmetry and it's integrable. It can be diagonalized via B transits. So we start with the vacuum where all the spins are aligned and we are going to choose for all these spins to be in the up direction. Okay. After that, we can start flipping some spins that will generate some uh, spin down excitations that assume the form of a quasi particle, which we call magnus. So that the eigenstates of the this Hamiltonian are simply n magnon states characterized by a set of rapidities u1 and u, un. Using either coordinate b transits or either algebraic b transits, we can write down these exact b equations for the rapidities of the, the magnons. And once we solve these equations, sometimes analytically, many, many times numerically, we can plug the rapidities into the dispersion relation and compute the energy levels of the theory. However, the, uh, the thing that I want to, uh, the question that I want to answer here is, can we find an analog of Schrodinger equation to generate these beta equations? Or can we find these equations in a more mathematical, mathematically transparent way? And the answer is yes. So the first observation that we need to do in order to achieve that is that uh, we can encode essentially all the information of uh, an in-game state inside a Baxter polynomial, which is sim simply a polynomial of degree n, which amounts to the number of uh, excitations that we have in a given state, and whose roots are simply the B2 roots amounts to the rapidities of the excitations. Nice observation is that uh, 
when you consider large U asymptotics, when you consider a large spectral parameter U here, uh, this become a monomial and the exponent of this monomial gives the SU2 charge of your state. After introducing this Baxter polynomial, we can write the Baxter equation also known as the Q relations, which you were already familiar from Fiora Vantis talk, where T, T is the eigenvalue of a transfer matrix. And here on the right hand side, we have introduce this notation to imaginary shifts on the arguments of Q functions. Once we have Baxter equation, we can notice a really interesting feature is that if we impose that T is a polynomial that amounts to canceling the poles that we will arrive from here in this equation, we can reproduce BT equations. But we have a sort of inconvenience with this construction is that it is a second order finite difference equation that has two independent polynomial solutions, Q1 and also Q2. And the physical origin of this existence of two solutions is simply that we have a freedom to choose what is the vacuum of the theory. First, I choose to be all spin ups so that the excitations would be spin downs, living in the sea of spin ups, this amount to, this amount to Q1. But we could also choose our vacuum to be spin up states, and the excitations will be the corresponding spin up states with, of course, different momenta that will be roots of Q2. Since these two functions are solution of the same equation, they should satisfy a Ronskian relation, just an analogy for the ordinary differential equations, which take this form of this QQ relation. And instead of having derivatives, we have these shifts on the arguments. In this case, have that this determinant is equal to a polynomial U to DL. And in order to understand to get a more transparent structure out of this, I will introduce two new Q functions, which I will call Q empty set, and I will choose just to be U to the L, and I will choose another one, which is Q12, which is simply one, okay? So that we can reorganize this Ronskian relation into a Hasse diagram, where we start with Q empty set, we start adding indices amount corresponding to the choices of vacuum of the theory that I can get, so, can go to Q1 or Q2, and then I can start merging these indices to get Q12, which I'll also call Q full set here. Then once we have this oriented as a diagram, I can read these Q functions in the order of the arrows, and this you give me this QQ relation. But the even nice observation is that we can do the covers. I can start with QQ relations, I will choose Q empty set to be this polynomial U to DL. And then I will impose that our Q functions are polynomials. And as you can see, this is equivalent to imposing the uh, B transit equation to all our model. And what is nice about this construction is that it generalizes super easily to any GL and slash M integrable super spin chain. In this general case, we will have two to the power N plus N Q functions. And the Q system will be a bit more complicated, but the idea is the same. For example, for a GO3 spin chain, the Hasse diagram is simply this cube. And then we start with Q empty set. We can have three choices for the vacuum, and then we can start merging indices. When we write the QQ relations coming from this phase and from this other phase, for example, or any other true choice, we get these QQ relations. And once we impose this polynomiality to Q empty set and polynomiality of these other Q functions, we can get the nested bit as equation for the model, which is pretty nice. So the philosophy that we get here is that for a given integrable spin chain, the symmetry, which is some sort of universal, it only depends on the symmetry algebra of the spin chain, will give an algebraic structure through the Hasse diagram and the QQ relations which when supplied with an atleticity conditions, which are model dependent, in this case, we choose it to be polynomials, but it could be different, it amount to BT equations. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, for QD4, you mean now, okay, with this, mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not too deformed, yeah, yeah. It's homogeneous. <laughs> 
É que o que o... Yeah, you can adapt it. You can adapt it. So, okay. And with this in mind, we can move to this philosophy in mind. We can move to our more complicated example of n equals four super young mules. Don't worry if you're not a specialist in gauge theory. We don't need much about for super young mules here. The only thing that you need to know is that it's the simplest gauge theory in 4D. And it is a theory about one gluon, six scalars, real scalars, four fermions and four antifermions interacting among themselves. All these fields live in the adjoint representation of SUN, so that the operators corresponding to physical states of the theory are the so-called single trace operators, where we take a bunch of these fields, and maybe it's derivatives also, as you can see here. We put all of them in the same space-time point, and then we trace over the color indices, so that we can get some uh, gauge invariant uh, quantity. And these are the observables we are interested in. When you start computing stuff, you discover that in the planar limit that uh, David explained to us, where n goes to infinite, the young mu's coupling goes to zero, but the Tuft coupling remains finite, there is a miracle because the theory becomes integrable, actually, in some examples. And for convenience, I work with this sort of effective coupling constant, G, here. Here is really peculiar. One of these nice features is that it's exactly conformal environment at the quantum level. So in order to solve the theory, we only need essentially two quantities, which are called the conformal data. We only need the scaling dimensions, which can be read from two point functions, and they have a bare a classical value, which is simply the mass dimension of the operator you're considering, but they also receive quantum corrections, which are called anomalous dimensions, which are interesting in computing. And fortunately, we only need to go one order higher, and we need to, comp to compute the conformal data. And we need to compute the structure constant, which is simply this constant that appears over here when you compute three point correlators between three different. Okay, so in order to solve this theory, we start analyzing its symmetries because we want to do something similar to what we did with the spin chain. And this is something really beautiful and really well understood. In this theory, the conformal generators mix with the supersymmetry generators and they merge themselves in a, into a really nice uh, global symmetry group, which is PSU 2,4, which is pretty similar to a GL4 slash 4, except from a real form and to a projection here. It has a bosonic part, which is simply SU 2,2, the conformal group in 3D and SU4, and it has a way more involved fermionic part, which is not so important for us. So we can use this group to classify our operators or states. For that, we restrict ourselves to the Cartan subalgebra of it, and we analyze its again values. So we get a first chart, which is simply the conformal dimension, which are interested in compute. And then we get two conformal spins from here. And we can also get three R charges which uh, correspond to the values of this SU4 part. So the first thing you can start computing is the spectrum of anomalous dimension. And as I explained it like last week, Mina and Zarembo started doing that in the perturbed. What they noticed is that we can map the single trace of an integrable chain. Really nice picture of n equals for super young mu's. For example, if you take the trace of Z to the L, where Z is a complex scalar, a combination of two real scalars of the theory. This can be mapped to the vacuum of a chain. This operator is really special because it is protected by supersymmetry, so it doesn't receive any quantum corrections. In particular, the anomalous dimensions of it, it's simply zero. So it corresponds to a vacuum without any excitations. Then you can start adding more fields that will be sort of excitations on top of this vacuum. For example, you can add M scalars, which will give operator, which is called an SU2 sector operator of the theory. But you can also add some derivatives, which will amount to an operator, which is called the SL2, non-compact sector of the theory. And here in this construction, we have a natural length scale, which is simply L, which amounts to the size of the spin chain that you have, MM, which is the number of excitations that you have on top of the vacuum. But the map doesn't stop here. The anomalous dimensions of a given single trace operator gets mapped to the energy of the corresponding spin chain state. So 
if we know how to compute these energies, we can get exactly the enormous dimensions. And using a lot of integrability and doing a strong use of these PSU two comma two slash four symmetry, Bizert and Saldaher they could beat Sanderson's equation for n equals four super n mu, which was pretty fine and allowed to compute lots of uh, anomalous dimensions for large operators. However, when you want to match perturbative data, which is let's say really data that we trust in a quantum field theory, we see that this Beaton's equation has some problems if you go to orders higher than three loops. And what's the reason of that? Simply because this is an asymptotic construction that doesn't take into account the finite size corrections to the spectrum. So in order to solve this disagreement, Gromov, Kazakov, which is also my PhD supervisor, Laurent and Volin, they proposed the quantum spectral curve, which is a full non-perturbative set of allow to take into account all these finite size corrections. In order to construct a quantum spectral curve, you get a lot of uh, inspiration from the spin chain, as always. So the first thing you start is with the symmetry. Okay, we have this PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4 symmetry, which is essentially a GL 4 slash 4. We want to construct uh, Q functions and QQ relations for this algebra. Okay, in this case, we have 256 Q functions, which is a lot. And the indices of these Q functions split into two. They have bosonic indices and fermionic indices differently. For and using the unimodularity of PSU to control slash four and some physical guessing, we can put that the Q empty set, which used to be U to the L for the spin chains, now will be just one. And the Q full set, as always, we also be one. The next thing we could do is to write explicitly the QQ relations or the Hasse diagram. Unfortunately, in this case, the Hasse diagram is a eight-dimensional hypercube, so we can see it. The only thing we can see is some projection here, for example, we have a projection where all Q functions with the same grading are identified. And that's not a problem because we can summarize all the QQ relations into these three equations. First two of them relate Q functions with more indices of the same time type to Q functions with less indices. So they are called bosonic. And the last one, we added different types of indices. So fermionic and bosonic. And these are called fermionic QQ relations. The nice property about these QQ relations is that they allow us to determine any desired Q function just in terms of eight elementary Q functions, which are going to choose to be PA, which is simply the single index bosonic Q for Q functions, and QI, which are the fermionic single index uh, uh, Q functions. And these two are related by a fermionic relation, which is simply this one, where the Q function QAI is a sort of intertwiner between both. And we don't like to work with too many indices. So to avoid writing things like Q123, Q123, we, we define the Hodge duals of these Q functions, so just contraction with uh, the VTV that answers. And then we you know these are those with upper indices and they will be really useful in, the, in our construction. This ends the algebraic part constant of the uh, quantum spectral curve. And now we need to supply these equations with some analytical structure. However, we know that N equals four spring muse is not a spin chain. So we cannot impose polynomiality of these equations. And then we need to get inspiration elsewhere. And this is where the SCFT correspondence uh, comes into the game. So you don't need to know a lot about ADSFT, but Maldacena tells us that uh, it's strong coupling. So G going to N equals four is equivalent to classical, even in a curved space time, which is ADS five crosses five. This specific theory is known to be described by a classically integrable sigma model. It can be solved using classical integrability, specific the finite gap method. The solution of this sigma model is given by eight functions, which are called quasi momentum. We have four of them corresponding to the degrees of freedom S5, and another four of them with indices corresponding to degrees of freedom 
ABS5. And after the work of uh, Gromov and Vieira, we know really well the analytical structure of these functions. We know that they live in a uh, H-sheeted uh, Riemann surface, and they all have uh, square root branch cuts. Taking inspiration from their solution, we can some sort propose the simplest possible uh, analytical structure for our p function that is compatible with string theory, which is our p functions will have only one single square root branch cut, which is short going from minus 2d to 2d. And q functions will also have only one branch cut, square root, not square root type, but now this will be a long branch going to plus infinity and minus infinity. This is not enough because we also need to know what happens when we cross these cuts. And this amounts to write these monodromy properties, which is just say that the, when we cross this cut, the analytic continuation of P functions will, give, give, uh, will be given by P functions with upper indices contracted with a new function which we call me that has uh, this quite weird analytical structure. It has an infinite letter of square root branch cuts that are equally spaced by one unit here. And same thing for Q where we have this omega function with this kinds of branch cuts. And this closed the human Hubert problem that in principle we can solve and get these functions. But now you should be asking ourselves, how can we get anomalous dimensions from it, which is our goal. And the answer is by looking at the asymptotics of these Q functions. So just as in the case of spin chain, when we consider these Q and Q functions at large spectral parameter U, they will become monomials. And the powers of these monomials are related to the charges of a given state. So the natural path to follow is first, we specify a state given it's uh, our charges and conformal spins. Then we solve quantum spectral curve either analytically, either numerically. And then we can get the anomalous dimensions of the desired operator. It's a really nice construction because it works for any local operator of the theory. So in principle, you could compute any anomalous dimension. People could extend it some, to some non-local operators like cuspid Wilson lines. And they could also do some analytical continuation on spin to reach BFKL regime. And more recently, last year, people could write a set of QS equations to compute the h darn temperature of any close for supreme use. It has passed all possible checks and we trust it so much nowadays that we start to produce new data with quantum spectral curve. For example, if consider Konishi is the simplest SL2 operator we can get, two derivatives and two Zs. We can compute using the weak coupling expansion of a quantum spectral curve. It's anomalous dimension until 11 loops, which is a really impressive result, which is way higher than what we can achieve using standard uh, perturbation theory techniques. So now that I show the power of quantum spectral curve to compute anomalous dimensions, we can we consider this problem of spectral anomalous dimensions as solved and we can tackle more harder problems. So we can go on or other higher and try to compute structural constants that came from uh, three-point correlators. So in order to specify a three-point correlation function, I need to give three operators. And here we only work with a really specific configuration where we have here on the top two BPS operators. This means operators corresponding to the vacuum of the spin chain. So there will be no excitations over these two operators. And in the bottom, I would choose an SO2 operator. For example, Konishi. And here in this bottom part, I can have excitations from this spin chain picture. The recipe to compute three point correlation functions is simply to draw all possible weak contractions between these three operators. And if we have large enough operators, this thing will start looking like a pair of paints, actually. In particular, it will be described by the so called bridge lengths, which are the number of weak contractions we can do between these two channels, these two, and also these two. So we have a blue, green, and red bridge lengths. Okay. And the idea to compute this, which was done by Basso, Komatsu, and Vieira, was to cut open this pair of pens. So you could decompactify this pair of pens into two hexagon shaped objects. This is pretty schematic. But what they could do is that they gave a precise meaning 
for these hexagon shaped uh, patches. And actually, they could interpret them as form factors in an integrable field theory. So just using the form factor um, axioms that I mentioned, they could bootstrap these hexagons to any value of the coupling constant of the theory. So it's non perturbative construction, too. However, we are not interested in hexagons. We are interested in structural constants. So in order to get back the structural constants, we need to glue these hexagons. And the first observation is that we find really large operators with large bridge. The answer for the structural constant factorizes. You can see that we have two pieces corresponding to different hexagons and they essentially doesn't interact among themselves. Here, the recipe is to sum over all possible partitions of interactions because we can cut it in different ways so that these is, um, excitations can be sp split differently between the two hexagons. Then sometimes we need to move these hexagons, so we need to take into account the propagation factor that depends on the bridge. It's a sort of characteristic length for the propagation of magnets on the hexagons. And sometimes they we need to cross, we need to scatter this uh, excitation. So we need to take into account also S matrix. That is works pretty fine and they could reproduce a lot of uh, large operators. However, just as in the case of phenomenal dimension, Uh, no, the, this actually, this is a monstrous sort of, uh, when you go to uh, this asymptotic limit where you have large operators, this is somewhat exact, but when you go to smaller operators, then you need to take into account finite size corrections. And then this picture is not valid anymore. It doesn't give right results. Sorry. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Because then, yeah, it, it started as an asymptote construction. Okay, so we couldn't just have factorization in the asymptotic case. But what we are really interested now is when we have small operators and then something happened. In these edges where we cut, which we call mirror edges, virtual particles can start appear and they can also propagate through the hexagons. So when we glue these hexagons together, you have a bunch of uh, virtual particles propagating over the hexagons and they are characterized first by its flavor, the flavor they can take an integer and natural number and also by its set of rapidities. And finally, by some weights that depends on its rapidities, describing how, let's say, how far they can go on this hexagon uh, sort of a word sheet. So we have a weight for the bottom bridge, which is uh, close to these two protected operators. We have a green one and also a red one. And we also need to include a propagator to take into account the fact that these green and red magnets, they can wrap over this direction. This cannot happen here, neither here, because these are protected operators. So when we consider all the existence of these uh, mirror magnets that are virtual particles, the finite size corrections take us form that is somewhat close to a resolution of identity. We need to plug all these weights inside an integral, then we integrate over all possible rapidities after we sum over all possible flavors. And this will give us the structure constants from in the context of this hexagon formalism. However, in the form it was originally proposed, these weights were actually divergent in some cases. So we needed to renormalize them to get sort of dressed weights on propagators here. And after some hard work, Lissandro and Benjamin, they could do that. And nowadays we have a, a conjecture form for all of these weights in terms of the Q functions that enter the QSC 
spectral curve construction. So it's a sort of new application to quantum spectral curve. To be more concrete here, I will concentrate on the bottom bridge, which uh, is the weight um, corresponding to Magnus being created here. And I, for a given flavor A, the weight of propagation of these Magnus, it's simply this contraction of shifted Q functions from quantum spectral curve. And we could verify this conjecture in a plenty of ways. For example, at weak coupling, it's really somewhat easy to expand these Q functions. There's a generator code made by Dimitro Volin and collaborators. And using that, we could reproduce the structural constant for Konishi, the simplest SO2 operator, until five loops. That is the best result we can get from perturbation theory, which was done by Alessandro and his collaborators. But we can go to another direction. This delta is a sort of propagator in this direction. I mean, we have this, the magnets can propagate from green to red direction. And this cannot happen here because they are BPS. Okay, so we only have. These are mainly right into uh, as functions of Y functions, actually. It's, we, can rewrite, yeah, we can write them in terms of F functions. It's a. Uh, yeah, 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 on TBA. The, all that started with TBA. So um, nowadays we have the Q function expression, but everything in the beginning was written in terms of uh, Y functions from TBA. But I wanted to skip TBA, so to avoid technicalities. So we can also do some strong coupling check. And in the strong coupling, which is described by string theory, these structure constants are described by the area of some word sheet that is attached to the boundary of ADS. And the boundary conditions here have to do with the operators that you insert. And at the classical level, Shoto Komatsu using classical integrability could compute these structural constants. So in order to see if our answer for our conjecture reproduce uh, his strong coupling results, we need the strong coupling limit of the Q functions. And this is pretty simple. It's essentially a WKB wave functions for the strings where we have integrals over the quasi-momenta here. We have a spectral parameter dependence here, and we have some prefactors that depend on the all or now of the quasi-momenta. And when we plug this into our ansatz, we can see that our weight WA, it reduces to a GL far slash far character, actually, which is a pretty nice mathematical result. We get This, you mean, this is, I mean, this is the Q functions that we can get from, ah, from the sigma model of the, the strings, from the sigma model, even the Metsev Zetlin sigma model. Not sure. Exactly, it's the classic spectral curve, it's the quasi moment of the antenna, it's the classical spectral curve. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Perfectly. So, yeah. Our weights reduces to this GL for slash four characters where this X and Y are simply this exponential of cosine momenta. And these characters are actually in finite dimensional anti symmetric representations. And indeed, this mathematical identity is a Komatsu's computation. Here we see some interesting mathematical structures appearing because these characters, they satisfy the classical Hirota equation, which is just simply this functional equation for functions T, A, S, they can take values on this L hook here and here on these boundaries. All of these functions are on one. They have some complicated values that can be computed here. And outside the L hook, they are zero. We can do a more complicated uh, strong coupling check where we also consider the weights for the adjacent channels. So do green and red channels. And in this case, the weights reduced to SU 2.2 slash 4 characters, an infinite dimensional representation, which are way more complicated. But they also satisfy Hirota equation, but now on a T shaped hook. And the last check we could do is in the asymptotic limit, where we consider the size of the operators to be large. And then these weights are related to SU 2 slash 2 transfer matrices, which are indeed part of the original hexagon construction, so we can reproduce known data. And they also satisfy quantum Hirota equation. Um, 
with this in mind, I hope, I expect that you could notice that quantum spectral curve, interesting mathematical construction that is also a really powerful tool to study multiple observables in n equals four superior mills, for example, anomalous dimensions and structure constants, but it's also a framework that in some sort unifies classical and quantum integrability. We can get inspiration for both of them and we can reproduce classical and quantum results by taking different limits of this quantum spectral curve. However, we still have some open questions. For example, we don't understand the origins of integrability in n equals four spring mills. We only know how to do these constructions, but they, we don't know where they come from. We still don't know if our construction is a UV completion for the hexagon formalism, because maybe we cannot compute structure constants in a clear way for operators with flyer and spin. And we don't know if we can extend our, our construction to other configurations, not only SL2, BPS, BPS. And finally, in the more speculative side, we'd like to know if it's possible to generalize this quantum spectral curve and hexagon construction to water theories, for example, a BJM where there exists already a quantum spectral curve. This open question. I thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Any question? Well, several questions during the seminar. <laughs> so thank you very much thank again. You. Perfect, thank you. Thanks, Felipe.